Welcome to the Fight Lawyer Podcast, where we discuss combat sports and the law. Our guest today is former UFC heavyweight champion, Tim Sylvia. Tim, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Hey, no problem, man. Now, you were born in Maine, played numerous sports as a kid. How'd you get into MMA? Kind of fell into it, to be honest. I, um, I, you know, I did karate growing up, and um, I started, I wrestled in high school, and uh, all of a sudden, this UFC thing kind of popped around, and I'm like, hey, that's that's awesome. I started watching it, loved it, and had, it, had the opportunity to start uh, doing some grappling and stuff under Marcus Davis. Um, you know, he was going out down to Boston and training with some guys down there. When he was coming back here, he was teaching me and some of the guys. We all worked together at the um, at the Bounty Tavern. Marcus was like the head bouncer, and um, so we started learning that way. And as it progressed, you know, there was an opportunity to go to Rhode Island and do an MMA fight that was open hand, one seven minute round. I said, "Sign me up! I'll see if I can do that. I like that sport." I went down, knocked the guy out in 17 seconds, and I was hooked. And you mentioned Marcus Davis. How'd that come together? Uh, Marcus was a you know a big name back in Bangor, Maine. He um, that's where you know I ended up moving where I was playing semi pro football, and we we were working together. So you know they just basically we were doing it for a better self defense, and and um, it jiu jitsu is a better way to to handle people in a bar. You know if they're drunk or whatever. You know, you slap somebody in a choke real quick and say, hey, I'm going to put you out if you don't if you don't fucking walk out the door. So they would walk out the door or they would go to sleep better than hitting somebody or kicking someone, you know, knocking them out that way and stuff. So you mentioned you were competing in some amateur tournaments, some grappling tournaments. How did you make it over to the early uh, to the UFC in the early days? Um, I started, um, you know, picking up the progress. I won the big main skirmish. Uh, the absolute champion. I was the uh, the gi champion, uh, the no gi champion, and then the absolute champion where anybody could enter. And I submitted everybody. And so we're kind of like, well, you actually aren't too bad on the ground either. You have a boxing background, a karate background. But I was just struggling trying to find, uh, you know, I'd show up at fights and guys wouldn't fight me. I'd walk in, you know, they're like, I ain't freaking fighting that guy. He's huge. So then I uh, was running out of training part of this stuff and, you know, went to my first UFC in New Jersey and met Militic and those guys. And they, you know, they kind of welcomed me with open arms like, Jesus, you know, Pat was like, you're a big son of a bitch. You're big enough to eat hay and shit in the middle of the road. I'll never forget that comment. And um, he's like, you asked if he asked me if I trained. I said, yeah, you know, a little bit, but I, you know, I struggle finding training partners. And he said, come to Iowa. We got plenty of training partners for you. So, you know, he gave me his number. We stayed in contact. And I'm, I think it was probably three or four months later, I went to Iowa for two weeks to train. And you mentioned your size, you know, 6'8". You were the biggest guy in most fights. Uh, how'd that help you early on in your career? Was it easier to get people to train with? Was it easier to get opponents, harder to get opponents? Oh, it was definitely harder. It was, you know, guys would, you know, they 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 wouldn't see me in, in person. But, you know, like 6'8", you know, 300 pounds or whatever. You know, back then I was playing semi-pro football I was you know I, I I think I was a pretty good athlete so you know you know when you walk up and you impose your you know six foot eight 330 pounds on a guy that's six foot he's like <clears throat> excuse me he's like holy shit six foot eight is big <laughs> so they, they would change their mind real quick and so your training partners you were training under Pat Militich you said that a second ago one of the top MMA gyms at the time why do you think Pat was able to procure uh, such high quality fighters at that early stage of the sport relatively? Um, I think because Pat knew iron sharpens iron. Uh, to be the best, you got to train with the best. You got to surround yourself with people that are better than you. So Pat would travel all over, you know, the Midwest to find boxes that were better boxes than him, find kickboxes that were better kickboxes than him. And jujitsu guys that were better jujitsu, wrestlers that were better wrestlers. And he knew if you got beat up in the gym and you were training with these guys every day, that the gym is a lot tougher than an actual fight. So, you know, people started seeing the success at this and um, basically he built it and they came. And it was tough financially at that time in the sport. You were training with guys like Matt Hughes, who were at the top of the of the list back in the day. Did you just look at them and say, hey, one day I'm going to be up there, or, you know, the money's not very good right now. I hope that at some point it gets better. Money was never 
a drive for me in this sport. You know, I did it because I loved it. I enjoyed it. It was fun. The camaraderie we had at our gym was awesome. Um, and to be honest with you, being the, the UFC heavyweight champ never really, um, never really was a focus for me. My focus was to get in the UFC. Um, and then once I get in the UFC, they're like, Hey, uh, you're not too bad of a fighter. You want to do a title fight? We're like, yeah, sure. We have nothing to lose. I'm like a second fight in the UFC. I'll fight for the title. And, and it just kind of happened. We didn't even realize, you know, that it was going to happen as easy as it did. And the sport wasn't as popular as it is now. Do you think fighters back then had that drive in them, that natural commitment that fighters today maybe don't have? They changed the limelight or the spotlight or something else? Yeah, I don't think the sport is, is, is what it used to be. And um, I hear that every day, if not once a day, that the sport's not what it used to be. People don't like it as much. People don't watch it anymore. Um, you know, back in the day when we were fighting, we were fighting, you know, there was six events a year. So every card you look forward to, you knew exactly every single fighter on it. It wasn't oversaturated. It wasn't watered down. I mean, shit, today, nowadays, you got A, B, and C level fighters fighting because they have so many shows. Um, it's just it's just watered down. It's not as good as it used to be. And Pat's gym ultimately fizzled out in terms of being one of the best in the business. Could they just not recruit top fighters, or what was it related to? Um. No, the main thing is, is we all got older and, um, you know, guys started going their separate ways. Guys had opportunities to, to make money at other gyms and guys, people were throwing money at all, all of us, you know, saying, Hey, we'll give you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. You start your own gym in St. Louis. Hey, we got a place in Salt Lake city. Come here and, and be the head trainer. We'll pay for your rent, your vehicle, your food. Um, come be in Nebraska, open your own gym. And, and it just kind of happened that way. And, you know, Pat was at a point in his, you know, he's done fighting and, um, you know, the IFL kind of helped out and he was paying his wages, but he had the opportunity to, to better himself and better his family in commentary to where he could make a really good living and not hurt his body at all because his body's been banged up for so many years and he took the opportunity and I don't blame him. I would have too, you know, him being the head coach, you know, once Pat kind of stepped aside and, and started doing um, the commentating and stuff like that. You know, guys just like, well, Pat's not around as much. I need more attention or I need, you know, more guys or whatever. And, you know, as we got older, I had no interest in in building a gym or doing anything like that. I, you know, once I kind of got out of the sport, I wanted to be out of it. Understood. Understood. So as your career progressed, you obviously became top heavyweight in the company, fought Rigo Rodriguez, UFC 41. What was the game plan going into that fight? Uh, basically, the game plan was to go in there and impose my will on him. We knew that I was a better striker than he was, and we knew that I was really tough to get down. Um, you know, we kind of feared, you know, if he got down and got, you know, got on top of us up against the cage, it was going to be a bad night for me. So basically, just go in there, get in his face, let him know that I wasn't scared, I wasn't going to back down, and um, defend the takedown and throw big punches. And that's exactly what we did, and got lucky and landed one of them in the first round. And, you know, these days, winning the title is associated with so many things. You can get pay-per-view points and all these other things. Back then, how different was it? Oh, it was very different. My first fight in the UFC, my first world title fight was 40000 and 40000 So I made, I made uh, 80000 No pay-per-view buys. I never got pay-per-view buys at all. We tried to get pay-per-view buys on my last contract that I signed with them, and they wouldn't do it, and that's... You know, a lot of the reason why I left when they wanted me to resign, they wanted me to resign, and I, I couldn't get pay per view buys, and I wouldn't do it. Um, we knew what, you know, that was when Brock Lesnar got signed, and um, we knew exactly what his contract was, and we asked, we asked for his same contract he got, and they said they wouldn't do it. So then my return to that was, well, okay, I'll sign the deal you want, but which was going to be a hundred, a hundred, which is what I ended on. Um, hundred thousand to show, hundred thousand to win. He was getting three hundred to show, three hundred to win, and pay per view buys. So we said, okay, well, let me fight Brock Lesnar, and if I win, I get his contract. And they wouldn't do that either. They say what they wanted to build him and this and that. So we kind of had the opportunity to leave them when we did, and we we took the opportunity and ran with it. 
in different times for sure. So you win the world title, you fight Frank Mir. You know, when your arm broke and, and that reaction was so nonchalant, was it kind of just adrenaline or, or were you just displaced from the moment in a bad injury like that? I was pissed the fuck off. I mean, I, I felt it break. When I, I thought I was safe and I, I heard my arm go pop, pop, pop. And I said, he just fucking broke my arm. I'm going to kill him. And that's when I picked him up with a broken arm and I spiked him, you know, and he, he went limp on me. And I picked her up the second time and her jumped in and stopped it. I, I really was confident enough to, if I was able to slam him one more time and start raining down left, left to his face, it would have been over. But um, Herb saved his life that night. As bad as it looked on screen, you looked completely unfazed as if it's not like nothing happened. Well, I mean, it, it you know, obviously there's a lot of adrenaline going and, and the pain tolerance of all fighters is, is extremely high. I mean, I mean, how many average men can get punched in the face as hot as you can by another heavyweight? You just kind of look at them and smile. I mean, there isn't too many people in the world that can do that. So our pain tolerance is abnormal from anything else. So, uh, you know, a broken arm is a broken arm. It really, it broke and it, you know, it hurt afterwards, but it wasn't that big of a deal. I know lots of fighters have gotten broken limbs and still keep fighting. I've broken my hand several times in fights and keep fighting, you know. Did you train jujitsu going into that fight, you know, kind of to prevent being caught by Frank? He was known as a guy that could take an arm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, he threw a lazy kick like, he, like what Rico did to me, and I powered through it with a straight right, and he just kind of grabbed me and pulled guard. So that's how he got me to the ground, you know. It just kind of... He kind of grabbed me a pole. I think he knew he couldn't get me down any other way. He wouldn't be able to, you know, shoot or take down a double leg or anything like that. It worked out well for him. Uh, and like I said, I, I think my, my arms are so much longer than anybody else's. Um, he had a steel cup on, so he used that as a fulcrum. But my elbow was out. You know, rule of thumb is if your elbow is outside of the, uh, the arm bar, you're safe. But my forearm is so long, it, it didn't get saved. And how long was the recovery after that fight? Was it something that kind of uh, you had to take some time off or you thought, okay, you can take a little rest, get back in there quickly. You got to make, obviously, like I said, you got to make money. You got to keep fighting. Um, I was in there pretty quickly. I fought five months after my arm break. I fought West Sims and knocked him out with my right arm. Um, you know, hit him with the right, dropped him and jumped on him and started raining down big rights and, and knocked him out. And then I fought for the title again after that. Um, and then it was against Andre Lofsky. He dropped me and... He jumped on my leg and on a on my leg and hit a heel hook and I felt pop 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 and I immediately just panic tapped. Um, to do all over again, I, if my arm hadn't been broken in the first fight, I probably would have fought out of it a little better or at least tried because it, he didn't break it. He was just you know whatever you know get, getting turned or whatever. I just freaked out so quick that I, I tapped. What was so tough about Andre as an opponent? Was it his power, his speed? Oh, uh, Andres, yeah. I mean, he's fast. He hits hard. I mean, that's, I mean, all, I mean, at the time, you know, he was a smaller heavyweight than most of us. Well, I, I guess he wasn't really small. That was kind of the average size of the heavyweight. I was kind of the abnormal size. But, yeah, I mean, he's just he was a heavy hitter and he was fast. Was he different at the time? He just seemed as a guy that moved differently, thought differently. He was ahead of the game, it looked. I don't think so, no. I, I think he was just a, a fast ball for everybody. You guys fought at a time where the UFC was lesser known. How important do you think your three fights ultimately had a fourth down the line? How important do you think those fights were to the sport, to the heavyweight division? I think it was it was very important for the, uh, the UFC and the heavyweight division. All of a sudden, you're seeing two heavyweights do a stand-up fight for 25 minutes going back and forth. I mean, that was that third fight. I mean, it was 25 minutes. Uh, it showed that we had endurance. It showed that we could, you know, just go out there and throw bombs. I mean, my hands hurt for a week after that fight. I hit him so much. I couldn't shake hands or anything. I couldn't even, you know, use the bathroom and wipe myself, you know, for the first three or four days because my hands were just so small and sore. I, I, I'm, I don't even know what the, the punch the punch count was, but I'm willing to bet, you know, it was at least, you know, 50 landed each round. I mean, we were going at it that third round fight. I, I thought that really showed the the evolve of the heavyweight division, the evolve of the sport for the heavyweights. And after your first loss to Arlovsky, you go on a win streak for a long, long time, and you get Randy Couture in 2007. Did you underestimate him in that fight? He was obviously the much older guy going in. Oh, absolutely. 
Um, I actually just hung out with Randy two weeks ago. We uh, he came here to the Quad Cities. We held a charity event for his for his charity and fundraiser and stuff. And we were you know shooting the shit about that. And um, I trained with Randy many a times before that fight. He flew me out to Oregon and I lived with him and stuff. Helped him get ready for a bunch of different fights. So Randy and I had a very good friendship. Uh, he was a great friend and. I think I kind of gave him a little too much respect in that fight. You know, Randy looked at it as a sport, and, and so did I. And I'm like, it's Randy Couture. I mean, I, I sparred this guy at least a hundred times. No big deal. I just I couldn't put the kill switch on for when I fought him, and you know he could, and he came away victoriously. And you were the striker going into that fight. When that first punch hit, did you kind of say, okay, now I gotta you know retool? No, not really. I mean, he, I mean, he caught me off guard because Randy would always do that little move. He would you know, fake the lead front leg and shoot a double. And, and, and he's done that to me 50 times before. And so when he faked that lead leg, you know, inside lead leg kick, I dropped my hands to, you know, catch the underhooks and he threw over him right instead. So, I mean, it was just a sneaky little tactical move he pulled and it worked out well for him. And after the Couture fight, you got a terrific fight with uh, Noguera. You beat him up for a whole lot and you got caught in a choke. How durable was he? You hit him with some big shots. Oh, he's very durable. I mean, I dropped him two or three different times. I couldn't believe he was still in there. And, and you know, I made a simple mistake, and he capitalized on it. And congrats to him. He was being hit so hard <laughs> in those fights. And, oh, he was, just, and then, then just in the like end. Just like the Fedor fights, the Krokop fights, the Bob Sapp fights. Everybody did it to him. But he was just like a cockroach. He would never die. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So you yeah. leave the, two, the, the UFC in 2008. You sign with Affliction. Uh, and you mentioned earlier the UFC was bringing Brock up at the time, throwing a ton of money at him. Why did you decide to depart at the time? Was it just a money thing? Or did you want to try something different at that stage of your career? Uh, it was a lot of things. It was a respect thing. It was a money thing. I, I, I didn't feel like I was treated very well at the UFC. I was being overlooked in certain areas uh, with the whole Brock thing. And um, I, I, didn't, I, I actually I wanted to fight Fedor. And I, you know, I didn't think he would ever do a UFC deal. So I wanted to see if I, I wanted to go out there and prove myself. I really thought... I could beat Fredor, and I, I just I made a mistake in that fight as well. I, I would have liked to have had that fight back again because shortly after that he got beat pretty easily by a, a couple, two or three guys. Um, you know, he was just the, the man that night. I wasn't. He performed, and I didn't. An affliction. You know, they signed so many great fighters at the time, and and the contracts were huge. The payroll for the big uh, for the first event was enormous. Did you think it was sustainable? Did you know it's going to be a few events, and then they were going to fizzle out? No, I, th- I mean, I signed a three-fight deal with them. I, I thought they were going to stick around. I was, you know, it would have been great if they did. I would have been set for life. But, um, you know, things happened, and UFC came in and, and swallowed them up and honored everybody's contract, but mine and Orlovsky's, and we both got screwed on the deal. And how hard is it with uh, fighting Fedor? Was he too fast? Was he too quick? Was he too strong? Was he too different? I mean, he fought in Japan for years, whereas you were out, you were out here. None of the above. None of the above. He just caught me. He just caught me with a left hook that rocked me and um, jumped on me, submitted me real quick. You know, it is what it is. It, I, mean, he, I made a mistake, and he capitalized. Was the punching power something you were used to? Yeah, I mean, every all heavyweights hit high. So, I mean, that wasn't anything that I hadn't seen or felt before. What were the talks with Affliction afterwards at the time? Uh, did you anticipate fighting somebody else? Who was on the, uh, who was on the come-up that you were going to fight? Yeah, I was, I was supposed to fight... Um, if I won, I was going to fight Josh Barnett. If I lost, I was supposed to fight Paul Bontello. And um, I got fucking knocked out by uh, Ray Mercer in a stupid fight. And um, so Affliction asked me not to fight on that second show, just to make sure I was fine, headwise or whatever. And um, then the... Did the second show happen? Yeah, the second show happened. I'm sorry. No, how did that work? So the third show, the third show, I was going to fight Paul Montello. The second show, I didn't, I don't know why, they didn't have the money to pay me because they paid everybody else so high or whatever. I'm not really sure. But then the, the third show, um, I think Barnett tested positive, And with that happening, the, a lot of the guys, that were back, the backers didn't like that negative feedback. And UFC came in and bought them up and they, they agreed to it. So yeah, I was supposed to fight Paul Bundello and it, you know, you know, later on we did fight and I ended up knocking Paul out. So that was a fight I would like to have had with Affliction. So I got paid a lot more money in Affliction than when I got paid in the other organization. 
And why'd you take on Ray Mercer? Why'd you agree to that fight? It, it was supposed to be a boxing fight. And I was like, well, it's boxing, so it can't go against my MMA record. And, and then when I got turned to MMA, I was, you know, he got in my head. He was running his mouth saying I couldn't stand up with him no matter what, this and that. And I, I just, he, he got me. You know, he got into my head, and I'm like, I can stand up with anybody. In reality, why take that chance? I knew if I, if I took him down, the fight would have been over in 30 seconds. But I let my ego get to me, and, you know, him talking all that shit, and it worked. And it made me stand up with him. <laughs> and he caught me with an overhand right. I actually dropped him. When we both connected at the same time. Um, I dropped him, and he dropped me. He just came too quicker. Was it harder fighting a, a fighter of that caliber? He was obviously a lot older, but uh, was it different? No, it wasn't different at all. I, I looked at his number of MMA fight. I mean, he just hit hard as hell. He's the first and only person to ever knock me out. So after the Fedor fight, you fight in some other organizations, like you mentioned, and try to work your way back into the UFC. What was the biggest change uh, that you see in the company now as opposed to the way they do business than when you were there? Uh, from what I understand, nobody, I mean, if I ever wanted to talk or see Dana, I would just call him, call him a text and say, hey, I'm in Vegas, I'm going to come to the office. Yeah, come on in. I'd go there and do it. From what I understand, you can't even do that now. It takes, like, appointments and months to get a meeting with him. I mean, yeah, it, it's oversaturated now. I mean, I, we were on Spike back then because I fought on Spike, but uh, it's just totally different now. They don't, I don't think they care about their fighters like they used to and not that they ever really cared about me, but I mean, it, it's just totally different now. I had to fight 15 times before I got a shot in the UFC, and now guys have got three or four fights in there in the UFC. It just proves to show you that it's oversaturated and there's A, B, and C level fighters. And there was a time when you tried to work your way back into the company. It didn't work out. Why do you think that was? Dana held a grudge. I mean, plain and simple. He got pissed off because I left and went to Affliction. And after that, you know, you could have went to Bellator or Strike Force. I know Bellator came around down the line a bit. Why? Why'd you never do that? I was making. I was the highest paid heavyweight outside of the UFC um, by fighting, you know, overseas and stuff like that. Um, I was making. I was making more money than guys in the top. Some of the guys in the top ten in the UFC. So I was being paid very well for my name and you know my attributes, and I did well outside of the UFC and. Um, they actually sent me, they wanted me back in the UFC. They sent me a contract and we took it, we signed it. And then when they were supposed to sign it, they changed their mind at the last minute. So uh, I kind of got burned again by them. A lot of you don't know about that about them, but that, that did happen. You transitioned some other endeavors. What are you up to these days? Well, I have a hunting show that's going to be airing on the Sportsman's Channel. It's currently been airing the last three years on Pursuit Channel. Um, you know, we're obviously on YouTube and all social media outlets, but I do a lot of hunting. I hunt over the Midwest. I, you know, I, I like, I like deer hunting. I do some turkey hunting, some bear hunting, but you know, that's mainly what I do. And I, now I currently have a seven year old son and I, uh, he's gotten involved in wrestling. This will be his third year wrestling. So I, I'm an assistant coach for his wrestling team as well. So, you know, it's kind of like the next generation. I'm, I'm looking out for my little boy. I'm being a dad. And I'm doing a lot of hunting. And I'm working on the hunting show. And there are fighters, you know, that have such a hard time transitioning to other things, whether it's TV or broadcasting or acting. Why you? Uh, why were you able to make that transition? Um, I've always been a hard worker, you know, and I've all I've been in the hunting industry for a long time. I've hunted my whole life, and um, I kind of set it up back when I was UFC heavyweight champ. Um, when I got into the hunting industry, people are asking me to be on their hunting shows. Well, they would cost a you know, if they can pay me and sponsors want to pay me. And I'm like, look, I, I don't need your money right now. I don't, I don't want your money. I go, just think, just remember me, you know, eventually I'm going to be in the hunting industry, the outdoor industry, and I'm going to need sponsors. I'm going to have my own show. And I, I appreciate it. If you just think about me and, and stand by me and support me then. And, and I was very fortunate enough that I got with some great sponsors and that's exactly what they did. And you mentioned your kid does some wrestling. If he ever wanted to go into MMA, the way the landscape is now, what would you say? Um, I, you know, I'm going to let him do whatever he wants. I'm going to try not to let him fight just because I don't need him to fight. A lot of people, you know, want their kids to fight because they want to live, live through them because they couldn't do it. Well, I did it. I was the best of the best in the world at one time. Um, you know, my body is all stove to shit. I'm all beat up. I'm sore every day. And I just don't want that for him when he's 40. So, 
you know, if, uh, I'm going to try to say, hey, look, man, you, you, you know, see how much pain I'm in, how I'm bouncing around. <laughs> let's, let's, let's maybe think about something else. When you look back at your career, obviously such a such a great career. What was the top moment? What do you look back now and say, "Wow, that was something that I'm really happy I did." I, I think winning the title the second time um, was the biggest achievement, just because I had to work my way back to that position to be number one contender. I had to beat a guy that was unbeatable that everybody was scared of who who has knocked pretty much everybody out that was in front of him. Um, And then I went out there and knocked him out in the first minute and a half. I think that was the biggest achievement for me was winning the title a second time. Do you watch the sport a lot now? Do you take an interest in it? Yeah. Yeah, I I love the sport. I I, I will always watch the sport. Um, I still have friends that fight. So, um, yeah, I definitely watch it. I watch all the free, the free ones, obviously. Um, I will not pay for a pay-per-view. I just won't. <laughs> I refuse to. So if somebody else pays for it, I'll watch it. But, yeah, I won't buy a pay-per-view. You know, Steve Bay's the, the big dog right now. I still think he is. Uh, as far as anybody else, I, I don't see a lot of great, talented heavyweights. I, I, I've beaten, I think, a couple that are currently still fighting. Brandon Vare is, like, the 1FC heavyweight champ, and I beat him. Ben Rothwell is still fighting. I beat him. So, I, you know, I think if I was in the UFC today, if I was healthy, I could possibly be in the top 10, maybe probably the top 20, just because I know Olofsky is still in there and stuff, and Josh Barnett. And so I, I just I can't get healthy. My knees are shot, and I'm always in pain. And you never got into coaching or doing anything else in the sport. Why is that? I kind of figure once I stepped away, I stepped away. It, there's, uh, it's not it's not for me. I just, I mean, I, I, I don't mind helping people out and stuff like that, but I just can't commit to it every single day, twice a day. I have things in my life that I want to do. I retired for a reason. I have a son now, so, you know, he takes precedent over anything. Understood. Tim, it's been so great of you to join us. Where could people go to find out more about you, how to get in touch with you? Obviously, you're going to hit me up on all social medias. You know, Hit Squad Outdoors with Tim Sylvia, uh, actual Tim Sylvia itself. Uh, we have the YouTube channel. My show uh, airs on Outdoor Adventure Network on Roku. It airs on Pursuit Channel uh, the first three seasons. And now uh, January 31st, 6 p.m. on Saturday nights will be the first show on the Sportsman's Channel this year. Very nice, very nice. Tim, once again, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Hey, no problem, man. Thanks. And that's our interview with Tim Sylvia. I hope you had a good time. Thanks so much for listening. My name's Dimitri Shakinovich. If you want to learn more about me, please visit www.dshacklaw.com. And this is the Fight Lawyer Podcast. Till next time, folks. <laughs>